that in a generally weak global economy, the United States has been chugging ahead. Um, yeah, I'd love to be growing faster, and we have to keep striving to do better. We have to strive uh, to make sure that the benefits of economic growth are more broadly shared. But just in aggregate terms, the U.S. economy has become the standard for the world in terms of how to recover from uh, you know, an enormous setback like the Great Recession. Um, we, uh, we, we are... Uh, we are not immune from uh, the slow global economy. Um, so we're seeing it pull the better part of a percentage of GDP growth mm -hmm. out of the US economy. We're still growing at over 2%. Mm -hmm. Now, I would love to get that you know, closer to three. Then everything we can do to move it by a tenth of a point mm -hmm. means more jobs and more economic opportunity and a better future. So there's a lot of work to do. But there's also a lot of reason to be optimistic about the kind of deep strength uh, in the U.S. economy. Um, I think we also have a lot of low-hanging fruit. And that, to me, means that we can do better and we know the things we can do to do better. You know, we, as a matter of policy, we know that we need to strengthen our infrastructure and that creates good jobs. That's a question of you know, will, not capacity. Um, I think that the, the, the you know, recovery has been uneven uh, and there are areas in the economy that are showing signs of strength which could give us the ability to perform better than you, know, you might expect. For example, housing. Housing lagged at the early and middle part of the recovery. It's just now coming into its own. And I think there's going to be some catching up. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, you know, young people who didn't start their own you know, homes when they might have because of the economic crisis. And they're probably not going to stay in that extra bedroom forever. Mm -hmm. We're certainly seeing signs. Their parents hope not to. <laughs> <laughs> Love them as they do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, 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 we're seeing household formation get back to more normal levels. We're still seeing very affordable housing. So I see a lot of things to be optimistic about. There's a lot of things there, to be worried about as well. There are, we have an ever-widening gap, um, uh, uh, income gap in our country, though. And uh, I, I know that, uh, uh, that you're working uh, very hard on uh, uh, the launch and the execution and the growth so that people can save. Uh, those that uh, uh, don't have access to uh, uh, any kind of retirement funds where they work. Uh, but can you touch on both of those? Yeah. Explain that program, uh, because I think it needs a lot more advertising. I think it's, it's terrific. Uh, but also what you think uh, can uh, narrow that gap, which is very troubling in our country. It's not really about uh, who and what we are. Constituents the, ask about it all the time. The, there, there's no easy answer, uh, but there are some easy steps we can take. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, I mentioned infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, from the founding of this nation, building infrastructure has been something people with my job were worried about. You know, mm -hmm. it was canals over 200 years ago. It's right. you know, airports, bridges, and you know. But broad President and, Lincoln built the. Uh, the Continental Railroad, imagine during the uh, war. During the Civil War. During the Civil War. We don't get to take a generation off investing in infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, because if we do, we'll fall behind. We've taken too many years off already. Mm -hmm. So Agree. we also know that the kinds of jobs that you create when you build infrastructure are good middle-class jobs. So that's a step we can take, and historically, it's been the kind of step that has had bipartisan support. Hopefully, in the wake of some bipartisan work over the last year, we'll find a path to putting more resources into infrastructure and creating more good middle class jobs, education and training. Mm -hmm. We have solutions. We have you know, several million, roughly four million jobs in this country that are open. And we have roughly the same number of people who don't have jobs, who if they had the skills could be matched up with right. the jobs. Now, that's a question of do we do the right things in our schools from high school and community college to four-year colleges and beyond. And we have solutions to that, and we ought to be able to have bipartisan conversations mm -hmm. about how to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. We also need to um, uh, you know, pay attention to the problems in our, in our tax system and you know, the fact that we have still rules that let some people have enormous amounts of wealth that go virtually untaxed in this country. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, and that's, those are the kinds of things that, that, that have easy, not, I wouldn't call them easy solutions, they're all hard, but they're, they're, they're knowable solutions. Um, 
uh, you asked about our retirement plan, my RA. Um, let, let me put it in the context of financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we have been focusing on is how do we connect people who have lower incomes and fewer means to the financial system. And why does that matter? It matters because if you don't have a financial history, you can't get a mortgage. That's right. If you don't have a financial history, you can't get a business loan. Mm -hmm. If you're not connected to the financial system, you don't have a chance to take the steps that lead to success. Mm -hmm. And financial inclusion matters to our economy overall, but it matters very much to opening doors of opportunity and to some of the equalizing of opportunity that you were asking about. Now, there are things that we know we need to do in terms of financial education, starting in grade school and high school and going on through life. But the area that we've taken a step already to deal with is retirement savings. Roughly a third of the people in this country don't have any retirement savings. One third. Um, roughly a third, mm -hmm. yeah. And that, it's kind of scary because it, Social Security was never meant to be no. the thing that you could retire on alone. It was always thought of as part of a system with pensions and savings. Mm -hmm. Now, we know pensions are not what they used to be. There's fewer and fewer employers who are offering mm -hmm. you know, fixed benefit pension plans. So savings becomes more and more important. Um, so if there's so many millions of Americans who don't have any savings, we've got to do something about that. We asked ourselves, what are the obstacles? The obstacles are it's too complicated, it's too expensive, and in many cases, too risky. So we created something that's simple, it's safe, and it's affordable. It lets people start accounts by just going to myra.gov, logging in, filling out a very simple form, and you can put away as little as you want, $5 a pay period, or you know, part of your tax refund and make a bigger contribution. No limit, no minimum. Um, no charges, no fees, no risk to the investment. The investment is in US Treasury bills in a form you know, that you obviously can buy through this account. But you can't go out and buy a $5 Treasury bill, but mm -hmm. it's a shared investment. Mm -hmm. So it's simple, it's safe, and it's affordable. Um, we think that it answers the question that prevent so many people from getting started. We also know that once you get started, watching your balance grow, when what you're giving up is the equivalent of a couple of cups of coffee, a pay period, gets you to do a little more, it's to stretch a little bit. And there's, um, there's every reason to believe that if people start saving early, even when it's hard, even when their incomes are relatively low, that when they start to make a little more money, they'll do a little bit more. And the number of people who have a secure financial future would just uh, grow dramatically. So we're gonna put a lot of effort into that over the coming year, uh, getting it out, communicating to people, working with partners like Intuit to do it on mm -hmm. a mass scale, and it was great this morning. And I think uh, uh, members of Congress, all of our caucus members, everyone should uh, uh, have uh, uh, take this out on the road, do a town hall meeting on it so that people are aware of it. Are so we'll help, to help you with it, how's that? <laughs> okay, you. we'll uh, get lots of accounts open. I just have two other, they're telling me to stop, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna ask two quick, <laughs> two quick questions because I think that um, because of their import. Um, the Paris uh, Climate Agreement uh, has given us all a great deal of hope. It's uh, nothing short of extraordinary. The investment that the administration made uh, uh, to prepare for uh, the meeting uh, and uh, the policies that we adopted in our country certainly uh, made the point with countries around the world. We're not just saying so, we are doing so. And um, it, it really is uh, uh, remarkable. And uh, we celebrate, we thought we were going to get to Paris to be part of the summit, uh, but uh, some things, some other things intervened, but uh, the budget, that's right. And uh, small things, uh, but small, things <laughs> small big things that uh, Leader Pelosi, isn't it uh, extraordinary what she got done? Extraordinary. You all uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is. It's really a breakthrough. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you is, what do you think the Im economic impact of that is, uh, of the agreement is uh, for us here at home and for uh, the global economy? 
Yeah, I, I think that the uh, importance of, of the Paris Agreement is at many levels. Uh, and obviously, um, it starts with uh, preserving uh, our environment and the health uh, yeah. of you know, billions of people around mm -hmm. the world. Um, but that's not just a health and moral issue because it um, involves human life. It's an economic issue. Mm -hmm. When uh, people lose work because either they or a family member are, are, are sick, a child has asthma, an, an adult has respiratory problems, that has an economic cost. Um, you know, there are cities in the world that I've been to where you worry about walking you know, from here to there because the air is so bad. I won't name any names, but it's right. more than one city where you can, when you can see the air. It happened there while the summit was taking yeah. place, right? Everybody can guess. And um, the, 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 <laughs> the, the economic benefits come at many levels because one of the solutions um, that we all are going to have to find is replacing fossil fuel use with other forms of energy generation, which create new uh, opportunities uh, in a more capital intensive uh, industry mm -hmm. for good jobs in the United States and around the world. There's no doubt that it will be, um, uh, there's a certain amount of disruption mm -hmm. uh, in the business as usual uh, way that things have been done. And it's very important that coming out of Paris uh, were commitments for developed nations to help support uh, poorer nations, less developed nations, to meet some of the standards. Because it's not good for the global economy or ultimately mm -hmm. the US economy to create deeper pockets of, mm -hmm. of poverty around the world. Um, but I think coming out was a fair uh, uh, agreement that you know, allocated responsibilities uh, in a way that uh, reflects the capabilities of countries and the ability, but that's flexible so that it can evolve over time and countries can grow into roles as they develop. Um, I think you know, it, it's kind of uh, unique in that uh, a development uh, agenda that was one that was at a, at a, at a uh, kind of global strategic level was rooted in financial um, reality. Yes. And there was a conference earlier last year in Ethiopia and Addis Ababa where financing for development helped lay the foundation for the agreements that were reached in Paris. I was proud to represent the United States at that conference. And it right. was built on the premise that it has to be a combination of public support in each country of some global development support in terms of, of you know, countries like you know, the United States providing development assistance and private investment. And that no country could stand back and not do its part, even a country that has less resources. Um, and it can't be done by government alone. Mm -hmm. Excellent. It, it, it is a landmark. It's so, um, after all the disappointments, um, finally, the stars were aligned. I think it and really it did happened. make a difference yes. in the United States. Yes. Uh, through well, the I think that it yeah. showcased yeah. Uh, American leadership, and, and the, we and couldn't have been prouder of that uh, uh, when we were um, disappointed that we weren't there, but we were still speaking through the megaphone uh, uh, in D.C. One more question, uh, and, and we've chatted about this before, and there are others that have raised it with you, uh, the whole issue of uh, re patriation of uh, American company dollars that are held abroad. Uh, when we first started talking about this, uh, I think it was 1.2 trillion. Uh, now some say it's up to four. Whatever it is, it's a lot of money. And uh, I, I kind of think of it as um, kind of a thousand dollar bill on the sidewalk and we're just walking past it. I mean, every single one of us would stoop over and pick that bill up and keep walking and kind of look over our shoulder and make sure nobody saw us pick it up. But at any rate, um, uh, there is bipartisan support uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the whole issue of repatriation. Um, tell us where you are on it and how you think we can get to yes. You know, I, I think that at the root, what we have is a broken business tax system in this country. Um, we have a, a system that on paper has the highest statutory rate in the developed world, um, but because of all the loopholes and deductions, the average tax rate is about average. Um, and because companies that are unable to take advantage of the loopholes and deductions are facing this 
a very high statutory rate, mm -hmm. it's driving them out of the United States. It's driving them to keep money out of the United States. It's driving them, in some cases, to, re to, to, to invert and take a legal address outside of the United mm -hmm. States. So at the core, what we need to do is fix a fundamentally broken business tax system. Um, in the course of doing that, what we would be able to do is lower the, the statutory rate for corporations in general, but have a lower rate for foreign income. Mm -hmm. And by l having that combination of policies and mandatory repatriation, uh, I think it would be a very attractive outcome for most uh, businesses that now feel that uh, if they bring their money home, it's going to get taxed at you know, 39%. Well, they're just not doing it. They're not doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the challenge to getting it done um, is is politics. Um, you know, you can have a substantive conversation across party lines and have an overlap that's like 80% in terms of core principles how to do it. Um, but we haven't been able to get across the finish line uh, because, uh, frankly, of a lack of will to do business tax reform on its own uh, without dealing with individual uh, taxes at the same time. I think that um, there's not the same consensus on what to do on the individual side. It's wrong to defer mm -hmm. business tax reform. And we had proposed uh, a solution on business tax reform, which I think is still the basis for a bipartisan agreement. It's to use the one-time revenue that comes from things like reforming our international uh, business taxes uh, to pay for a big investment in infrastructure, in infrastructure and to solve two problems at once. Frankly, it's two problems that the business community considers at the highest level of priority. The only other issue that I've heard businesses talk about with the same kind of importance are immigration reform and research and development. You know, so it's like half of the agenda that matters, at, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so importantly to most businesses. Um, I think it would also be good for our economy and uh, good for uh, creating middle class jobs in this country. Um, so I hope we can get through the political barrier and get this done. Uh, well, I was we'll put it in our collective bucket, right? Absolutely. For 2016. And if we can't get it across the finish line, we can get it worked through sufficiently mm -hmm. so that it's ready to be done um, you know, when a new administration... And we've learned back. things because there was a uh, repatriation that Congress had put into place some years ago and there were abuses of yeah, it. Yeah, the way but, it, it didn't but, work uh, that uh, time. Yeah. Uh, but all the better that we know what went wrong right. so that we don't make the same mistake again. That's right. But we shouldn't overlook those resources yeah. and what they can do for our country. A one-time vo voluntary tax holiday doesn't do <laughs> is uh, the kind of good that restructuring our yeah. tax code would do. That's great. All right, so we're going to go to the audience, uh, Mr. Secretary. Who do we have first? Where are we? I know David has the microphone. Thanks. Hi. Uh, my name is Kevin Richards. I'm with SAP America. Uh, thank yes. you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us. I don't think you could ask for a better congressional host, but I'm biased. And thank you to the California delegation for everything you do on behalf of the innovation economy. Uh, my question is around big data. Um, the administration has a big data initiative. They have the nation's first chief data officer in DJ Patal. And the Treasury Department's been leading efforts around the Data Act. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the opportunities and the potential of big data from your position in the nation's financial system. Thank you. You know, th there's a lot of benefits that come from uh, being able to, you know, use uh, the availability of information um, that, you know, gives you the ability to see patterns and opportunities um, in policy making and in, in, as businesses have learned in doing their own business. Um, you know, the challenge uh, is to do it in a way that's respectful of privacy. Um, while still bringing you know, anonymous aggregated data available uh, for the purposes that are totally appropriate. I, I think that um, you, know, you, you take something like financial inclusion. Um, if you don't have a history of um, having uh, credit cards, right now um, establishing yourself and getting a mortgage is almost impossible. We know that there are a number of other indicators that um, tell a lot about a person's ability and willingness to repay their loans. You know, how they um, have their history in paying utility bills, uh, cable bills, cell phone bills. 
Um, in, in a way, that is a form of big data. It's taking the different pieces of information and asking a question in a different way and getting an answer that's as reliable as asking it in the old way. Um, you're having the ability to do that, whether it's you know, a private uh, or a public uh, kind of, of review, opens possibilities um, to uh, including uh, people who are left out of our financial system. So uh, you know, th that's just one relatively micro example, but one that I've been focused on recently because there's some very innovative things going on. You know, we all know what a FICO score is. There's an alternate FICO based on the, the things that I just described that hopefully will open the door to uh, financial inclusion to millions mm -hmm. of Americans. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Jim Wonderman, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, welcome to Silicon Valley. Thanks for being here. Thank you, uh, Congressman Eshoo mm -hmm. and the team for uh, calling us all together. So I wanted to ask a question, Mr. Secretary, about uh, China. Uh, uh, obviously, this region, this country has tremendous connectivity and exposure to the Chinese economy. Markets were pretty spooked today about what's going on in China. How do you see what's uh, the progression in China? What should we expect in the future? And is there anything that we can, we can do about it? So I, I refrain from commenting on day-to-day -day market movements uh, because you could wake up in the morning and uh, find out that everything that happened yesterday uh, didn't because of happen, what you said. It doesn't happen <laughs> tomorrow or you act differently because of what you said. Um, so let me answer your question a bit more generally. China's in the middle of a, a, a historic transition. Um, it's on a path of uh, commitment to making economic reforms. Uh, to you know, fix some things that are broken in its economy and to step up and uh, live by norms uh, that are comparable to the norms in the, in the United States and the rest of the world. They've got a ways to go to complete that process. Um, the challenge is how do you get there and what does their economy look like now and what will it look like then? So it shouldn't surprise anyone that there's a decline in industrial output uh, in an economy that's in a fundamental transition from an industrial model to a consumer-driven economy. They're not yet at a consumer-driven economy. They're still heavily an industrial economy. But as they move along that progression, it's going to create the basis for more stable, sustained growth in the future. Conversely, if they stick to a purely industrial model, um, and if they do it by protecting markets and doing things that are unfair, either in terms of currency practices or other things, apart from the fact that it will create terrible tension with us and others around the world, it won't lead them to a solution to their core economic problem, which is excess capacity that comes out of um, a centrally planned economy allocating resources that needs more market-driven uh, allocation um, me mechanisms. Um, from my interactions with China's economic leaders and its political leaders, I think they understand what they have to do and where they have to go. I think that they have a lot of anxiety about getting from here to there because they worry about causing either social or political instability as much as they worry about uh, the economic uh, impact. Um, I think we have to continue to uh, be a kind of beacon saying this is what you have to do if you want to sit at the table and you know, play by the rules that everyone plays by. But we also have to um, give them credit when they make moves that reflect a commitment and follow through. And um, you know, I, 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 I think that in their recent fifth plenum, you know, when they kind of recognized that a more stable growth rate would average more like six and a half percent than over seven percent, it was a re reflection of reality, um, but it was taken by some as being a sign of, of slippage in the economy. I think we all have to not consider it slippage when the obvious is stated like that. Um, and frankly, in order for them to get to sustainable growth, they will probably have to have some years below their target and some years above their target in order to get to an average that hits their target. We have time for one more question. Hi, um, my name is Mitchell Baker. I'm co-founder of Mozilla. And I wanted to return, if I could, to the innovation economy question, which is obviously important to us here. And in particular, the question, you know, innovation is really exciting until it happens to you and you're the one disrupted. <laughs> um, 
And then the response, of course, is to protect yourself. And so at a large social scale, that is a protection of the status quo. And so my, my question is how you think about it, how we think about it, what we in Silicon Valley can actually do to encourage a true innovation economy. I think we're successful here because of many intangibles. And one of the core issues is the status quo already exists. So it's a, obviously an industry, it's got money, it's got access to our legislative bodies. What innovation represents is the unknown potential of the future. It's the hope of the future, and so we don't have the structural elements or the organizations or the companies that are so clearly protecting it, and how to think about that and really build an organization that has some structural protections for actual innovation, even when it's threatening to pre-existing organizations. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's no question that the status quo resists uh, um, unsettling uh, change uh, and innovation, you know, when it works, um, changes the status quo and there's some breakage in the process in terms of the status quo. So I don't think it's a surprise that there's a tendency for old uh, you know, ways to die hard. Um, I think the, the, the kind of secret sauce to the U.S. Uh, uh, success over the last um, century plus has been we're willing to tolerate that breakage uh, for the good of, of growing and having a better future. I mean, just in comparison to the conversation we were having a minute ago about China, you know, if China is willing to tolerate some breakage, they'll have a better future. It's not, it, it, you don't make change without disrupting something uh, along the way. By the same token, I think we have to be careful as we move into new technologies uh, to hold new technologies to the same core standards that we hold uh, old status quo um, uh, technologies. And you know, issues like consumer protection matter just as much regardless of the medium that you're transacting through or the, the uh, information technology system that you're communicating over. And um, I think we have to not be technophobic, not put new barriers in the way of things that are different because they're different, but we also ha can't treat um, things as if um, they are a, you know, fine if in fact they expose potential consumer um, uh, practices that uh, would be undermining to core values. Um, you know, uh, this is a dynamic process. And um, it's one that, uh, by asking the questions, uh, we can't ever put ourselves in the place where what we're saying is we need to stay the way it is because we're afraid of change. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't be afraid to ask the kinds of questions about how to do it in the right way. Mm. What a lovely way to express it. Um, I don't like goodbyes and closings, <laughs> but they have to happen. Yeah. And uh, uh, today has been, um, I think an extraordinary day for so many of us here uh, in, in the Valley. Mr. Secretary, thanks to you, thanks to our leader, thanks to all of you. Um, what I'm struck by is that we're, we're never going to, I shouldn't say never, uh, we're not going to sustain uh, what our achievements are um, uh, and, uh, and move forward unless we work together collaboratively. Uh, it's up to all of us. It's not just the two of us that are sitting here. It's all of you and what you represent. And uh, uh, the leader spoke, uh, uh, offered a magnificent quote of uh, President Kennedy's about uh, uh, why it was so essential for America to be number one. Not just to claim that post, uh, but what we could do with that leadership uh, not only for the American people, uh, but for people around the globe, because we are the essential uh, nation. Uh, there's no question in my mind about it. So I, I want to share with you something uh, that he said um, about going to the moon. And uh, I think that when he spoke about being number one was during that time frame as well. He said, we need to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. 
uh, you make America part of winning in the most important and broad ways, Mr. Secretary. And I think that we would all agree that he is a worthy successor of uh, the first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. So thank you for traveling across the thank country you for to having be with us. Today. Thank you to all of you. And thank you, thank you to the Computer History Museum. Thank you, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So wonderful. Okay. Do you want like the Commonwealth? Um